Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Contact us to find out how you can you can milk it for all it's worth. Well, late July and early August, they're the peak of the season for sweet corn production in Virginia. Selling sweet corn on the farm is just one example of a trend we're seeing with Virginia agritourism. According to Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, agritourism is now a $2 billion industry. That's our focus during Ag Insights later in the program. We'll also have a story about an apparent increase in ticks in Virginia this year, and yet another story on crop conditions as we conclude the month of July. Plus, we'll share a book review that sheds some light on preventing predators on the farm. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. Field conditions in Virginia have deteriorated a bit during the month of July. The latest crop condition report provided by the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service indicates the spotty rainfall most farmers have seen in July has led to a decrease in pasture conditions. Thanks to favorable growing conditions in early summer, most farmers, however, say pastures are holding their own, but there is definite room for improvement. The best pastures appear to be those where rotational management techniques have been implemented. Virginia farmers who grow corn, soybeans, peanuts, and cotton, they report generally good field conditions with mostly adequate soil moisture. There are reports, however, of some very dry fields in parts of the Old Dominion. Well, when you taste a great steak, oh, there is nothing like it anywhere. Virginia cattle producers and the overall beef cattle industry, they're working hard to ensure that every steak has a consistently good taste. Bob Severa has the story. Beef's challenge is also its opportunity. Meat scientist Bridget Wasser talks about the ways lipid, carbohydrate, and protein components all influence beef flavor. There's all these different flavor notes that are in beef. These compounds are just waiting to be activated when we heat or cook beef. Um, but that adds to the complexity as well, because beef isn't just as it tastes good or does it not taste good. There's just individual flavor attributes and notes and descriptive terms that we can use that all have to kind of be turned on on the right way when we heat and cook beef to get a great beef eating experience. And so it adds to the complexity, but it also makes beef a really unique tasting food that's unlike like any other protein or any other food item out there. Most taste panel research says beef stands out for its buttery beef fat flavor. A big driver of beef's lipid component that impacts flavor is marbling or intramuscular fat. Um, there's such a unique flavor with that marbling fat. Um, it's described as a buttery beef fat flavor, and that's unique to beef. And there's, there, it's not present in other uh, proteins, that buttery beef fat flavor that beef marbling has. So it really gives us that uniqueness and that kind of a competitive advantage in that sense because uh, that is such a preferred and liked flavor by consumers. Genetic selection and management that focus focuses on intramuscular fat can improve that specific flavor note. That marbling fat is is affected by our production practices, genetics, uh, days on feed, what we feed, grain feeding, for example, is, is really required to get intramuscular fat or marbling, and that's worth it because it really does impact positively the flavor experience, and, and that really is why marbling is um, so rewarded in our beef industry and our quality grading system because it does directly impact not just flavor, but tenderness and juiciness as well in a really big way. When consumers spend more on beef than competing proteins, they expect more. That's why it's so important for the beef community to keep making improvements. 
they're thinking about a great beef eating experience. They're thinking of some of those kind of key product attributes that us in the beef industry are very familiar with, like tenderness and juiciness and flavor, things we know have to be good in beef to have a great eating experience. But the consumer also thinks about things like how beef smells, how it looks, does it look fresh, does it smell great? Um, so it's kind of that whole package that the consumer is looking for. They eat with their mouths, but they also eat with their eyes and their nose and all their senses. I'm Bob Cervera. Thank you, Bob, for that report. Well, a new chapter of the Farmer Veteran Coalition was recently established in Virginia. Officials with the nonprofit organization say they believe that military veterans make ideal candidates for involvement in agriculture. One of the efforts of the organization will be a new campaign called Homegrown by Heroes. It'll become part of the Virginia Grown labeling program. The Virginia chapter of the Farmer Veteran Coalition has been recognized by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Information can be found at the website farmvetco.org. Well, farmers need to be careful working in the field this summer. The reason is that ticks appear to be rampant in 2017. That's according to a recent news release from our state's largest farm organization, Virginia Farm Bureau. New cases of Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever are being reported on a regular basis. Farm health experts say that farmers should wear light colored clothing. That makes it easier to see the ticks. Farmers should also tuck their pant legs inside their socks when working in tall grass or hay fields. And using insect repellent, that's a good idea. Keep a can in your pickup truck and a spare can in your tractor. Well, Virginia peach growers apparently dodged a bullet of sorts in 2017. If you recall, there was significant concern over some very unstable weather conditions back in March and April of this year. There were numerous warm days followed by cold nights, which is not good for peaches. In the end, however, we have a great crop of peaches rolling in all across the state. Even though Georgia and South Carolina lost up to 80% of their crop, Virginia growers are harvesting numerous varieties of peaches. According to the USDA, Virginia Orchards produced $5.2 million worth of peaches last year. We just might top that number in 2017. Virginia has 244 farms that produce peaches. A directory of orchards can be found at the website virginiagrown.com. Well, you can't win unless you enter. That's the advice from officials at the State Fair of Virginia, who say registration is now open for the State Fair's many competitions. Everything from baked goods and homemade pickles to giant pumpkins and apples will be judged prior to and throughout the fair, which this year runs September the 29th through October the 8th in Caroline County. Now the current giant pumpkin record is 1,232 pounds, which was set in 2015 by Hank Houston of Spotsylvania County. Now I'm told there's a considerable effort underway this summer to beat that record, but we won't know until September. Learn more about entering your items in State Fair competition at the website statefairva.org. Well, at this time of the year, a lot of people are visiting farmers markets and roadside stands and more. Agritourism has become big business in Virginia. And that is our focus on Ag Insights this week as we visit a sweet corn operation operated by the Lohr family in the Shenandoah Valley. It's coming up next. Hi everybody, Jeff Ishi here with another episode of Virginia Farming and today we're in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. It's the middle of the summer and we're here on the Lore Farm. It's called Valley Pike Farm in Broadway, Virginia. My pleasure to welcome to the program today, Thank you, Matt Lore. Good it's to be a with you. <laughs> pleasure to be invited to your farm. Thank you. I think no introduction is really necessary. Most of our viewers will understand. You're the former commissioner of the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Mm -hmm. You were also director of the Farm Credit Knowledge Center. Mm -hmm. uh, you were a state officer and I believe a national officer in the FFA organization. So there's your introduction, <laughs> <laughs> which not, not a whole lot of introduction is necessary. But to be here on your farm today, it's a real pleasure. I wanted to talk with Matt today. His family has uh, been making a transition from what most of us would call 
traditional agriculture uh, into more agritourism, sweet corn, pumpkin patches, and Matt, that's, that's one area that I'd like to explore. First of all, tell us about the history of this farm. I understand that it is a Virginia century farm. It is, proud to be a fifth generation farming here, and now I have six kids that are farming alongside of us as the next generation, and my parents are still involved uh, here on the farm as well. So it goes back to my great-great-grandfather um, way back in the day, and so um, that's something when you get up every day and look around to know that five generations have been farming this land, it's pretty special. Tell us about, um, going back to when you were growing up here on the farm, what were the primary crops and yeah. was it poultry? Tell us about what was going on here. Yeah, we've been in poultry forever. In fact, my earliest memories as a child, I was five years old walking with my grandfather. They raised turkeys out on the open range, kind of way back over yonder there. And so we've always had poultry. And then uh, they got into broiler production with the old Rockingham Poultry Cooperative feeding by hand, watering jars, everything by hand. And in the early 80s, we made the transition into um, automated poultry. In fact, my dad was one of the first growers in the country that had the Ziggity water nipples, huh. where they had the automated waters and back in 1981. So uh, we have four broiler poultry houses today, and that's been really the main staple of the operation. When I graduated from Virginia Tech in the mid-90s and came back to the farm, I really had a passion for connecting with the public. And so our first year, we started with a half acre of sweet corn and a half acre of pumpkins and used to sell that out of our front yard. We were open from 12 to 1. People would come up the driveway. I'd run out over lunch and sell <laughs> corn till 1 o'clock. Then I had to get back to work, you know. But we realized even way back then that people, they, they crave and desire locally grown food. And so we've seen that trend explode over the last 20 years, but we've been involved in it now for a long time. Well, let's, let's talk about that trend with what we now call agritourism. 20, 25 years ago, there were very few farmers markets, very few roadside stands, very few farm wedding venues, wineries. We've yeah. seen an explosion in wineries, all sorts of agritourism. But tell us about your decision to lead your family here at this farm, this historic farm, into agritourism. Well, so we've been involved in agritourism for, for many years and really it all came with this particular farm, the location, we're right off Interstate 81 got beautiful views of the mountains. So a lot of times people would drive up our driveway and say, I just want to park here and, and take in the view. <laughs> when people are willing to drive to your farm just to park and look around, you know you've got something special. So about, uh, I guess about 12 or 13 years ago, we started into the you pick pumpkin patch. Again, starting off very small, expanded that, then with corn mazes and then field trips and hay rides and pedal cars. And so um, that really, really grew into a booming business. My, my late wife, Andrea, passed away in 2011, and we kind of put that agritourism piece on hold for a while. Um, she really was kind of the driving force behind that back at the time. But now that we're remarried, uh, my wife, Beth, has that same passion and, and six kids now. Uh, we're ready to, to jump back into that again. So this is the first year where Beth and I are taking over the, the sweet corn operation from my parents who are slowly transitioning into retirement and next year we're going to be getting back into the agritourism with the pumpkins. For us, um, for one, we have six kids and they're very interested in helping and when you're involved in agritourism there's so many jobs that have to be done and so it made sense that if they're willing to do it and we need to pay someone to do it, let's pay our own kids and that way they can learn mm -hmm. about running a business and save up money as well. Plus it's teaching them about a love of farming and agriculture because this beautiful farm hopefully will continue for another generation and so we want to get them established and having a love as well. Uh, of course in your travels as the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture and in your travels with the Farm Credit Knowledge Center, mm -hmm. you saw a lot of examples of agritourism across the state. Tell us about some of the kind of the unique things that you saw. We were oh, yeah. talking about um, moonshine might be the next big thing in agritourism in Virginia. Yeah. We, we don't know, but well, wineries, I know we've seen an explosion. Absolutely, it's fascinating. When I was commissioner under Governor McDonald, I mean, he made it a priority to, to really invest in the, the Virginia's winery industry, and now there's close to 300 wineries. Um, Henry Child's family, the Crown Orchards, they're in Charlottesville. You go up to the top of their beautiful mountain on an October Saturday, and there's thousands of people. Again, the views are beautiful. They're involved in picking apples or pumpkins. It's a family event. And that's really what, what drives people. It's, it's a chance to do things together with your family, connect to nature and agriculture. But we've seen wineries continue to grow, breweries 
have continued to grow meaderies and now distilleries uh, seem to be uh, very popular as well as as well as event venues and wedding venues. Let's talk about sweet corn, one of my yeah. favorite topics. <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> now you grow several different varieties mm -hmm. and these are, tell us about your planting schedule sure. and, and how you do that. Yeah, well currently we're doing 12 acres of sweet corn and we plant in early April. Uh, we start off with a, a really sweet white variety that's kind of tolerant to some of the colder soil temperatures that time of year. And then we plant about an acre and a half every week until I think about one more planting we'll, we'll do it. That way we've got corn every week coming on about a, about a week and a half or about an acre and a half every week. And so we retail everything right here at our farm. We've got a, a shed at the end of the road. We don't have to travel to farmer's markets. We don't wholesale. It's, we sell everything right here. We pick daily and we, uh, we try to sell out by lunchtime every day. So <laughs> having six kids comes in handy sometimes when there's work to be done. It does, good labor pool there. That's right. I yeah. wanna ask you a farmer question now because a lot of farmers, I think they're interested in agritourism and diversifying the farm. But one thing I have found, and farmers have told me this, is they're not really comfortable with marketing. For instance, the pricing of a product. Yeah. What do you charge for tomatoes? What do you charge for sweet corn? What would be your advice to those farmers? Yeah. Would it be to, to bring in outside people who can assist you in that effort and you concentrate on the production? Or mm -hmm. what's been your experience? Well, for us, it's just been doing our homework. I mean, especially when you look at marketing, what are other people doing? And so we've been pretty creative in looking at ways to connect on social media. Um, this year we're taking credit cards for the first time. Uh, again, just little things to help accommodate the public. So look around and see what folks are doing. Um, there's lots of conferences. Virginia now has an agritourism conference where you can go and sit in on workshops and ask the experts and see what's working for, for you. And, and what really got us started, I had friends that were down in Halifax, Virginia. You know, may know the Reese family, Don Reese yeah, and his yeah. family. Uh, 15 years ago, I drove down there and said, we want to grow pumpkins and we want to raise sweet corn. Can you help us? <laughs> um, Dan Brands, another one of yep, my friends, yep. he does about 30 acres of pumpkins now and sells to about 20 Walmarts down wow. in the Blacksburg area. Um, people are willing to, to share knowledge and information. So I went to them and said, can you help me? What do I need to know? And so they were very generous in sharing information. And, and so now we're kind of all part of that, of that industry together. As far as the pricing goes, again, kind of look around and see what what people are charging and then you have to make a decision our goal is not to be the most expensive uh, we don't want to be the cheapest but we want to kind of be in that middle and but most importantly is to have a good quality product mm -hmm. because you can be the cheapest but if your if your quality is poor they're not going to come back so it's 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 a matter of finding that proper balance of being the right price with the right quality and then having the service to go along with it just a couple of minutes remaining in this segment and today of course uh, we are on valley pike farm and Broadway, Virginia. Beautiful website, by the way. I want to commend whoever designed your website and, and your social media presence. Very important. But to wind it all up, where do you see it going from here in Virginia? What's the trend? Where are we going to be in 2037? Yeah. Yeah. You know, 20 years from now, when your kids are all adults, <laughs> yeah. what are they going to be doing? That's a great question. And, and I, I love to look around and, and kind of ask that question, what we will see. For us, we placed conservation easements on our farm last year, so the farm will always remain in agriculture, but we have opportunities to, to participate in agritourism. So for our farm, for example, I would love to see a, maybe a wedding venue, possibly a distillery at some point, or a winery, um, something that will allow people to come and take in these beautiful views and still be connected to agriculture, but allow our children a chance to, to make a living here if they want to. And so, I think that no matter what the, the hot item will be in 20 years, people will still want to come out to the farm. They want to connect with the person that's producing the food. They want to know how was it raised, what were the ingredients, what was the process, and they're still going to want to be involved in some degree. So I think that trend's going to be here a long time, and it's exciting right. to see the innovation that's out there and the trends that will continue to happen. Some of the innovation and the technology is just amazing to me. You pull out your smartphone and you can monitor your poultry oh, house. Yeah, we do, yeah. You, you, <laughs> yeah. You, can, you can respond to customer requests Absolutely. while you're out in the field. I, this morning I was picking corn at 7 o'clock and I got a ding, and somebody <laughs> wondered if we had bicolor corn available today. So, I mean, it's, it's constant. That's really taking advantage of that technology 
And it also reduces your cost for marketing and advertising. Sure, yeah, Facebook is free. So I mean, <laughs> we can, can market and advertise and take care of all of that without paying a penny. And the cool thing is if you provide a good service at a good price, people tell their friends and then word of mouth spreads and then you have a reputation. So my goal this year is really not to spend a penny on advertising and, and really get the business established and we'll see where it goes from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting thank us out to the farm and it's been a real pleasure to be here on Valley Pike Farm. Uh, the website once again is? Lowersfarm.com. All right, beautiful scene. You got the mountains, you got sweet corn, you got beautiful farm country here in the Shenandoah Valley. Thank you so much for inviting us out thank again. You. Thank we'll you. be back in just a moment. Well, this week we're reviewing a new book about farm predators. It was recently published by Story Publishing and should be of interest to farms with livestock or poultry. The Encyclopedia of Animal Predators allows farmers and livestock producers to learn how to effectively and humanely prevent livestock, poultry, and pets from becoming prey. Published in 2017, this colorful book provides comprehensive profiles of more than 50 animal predators. It teaches you how to identify their habitat, as well as how to learn their tracks and attack patterns. Are you having problems with predators in your free-range chicken flock? Is it a coyote? Maybe it's a raccoon, or even a bobcat that's doing the damage. Author Janet Donner provides the reader with hundreds of colorful illustrations showing everything from the common skunk to the powerful black bear, from the ever-present possum to the dangerous mountain lion, and from black vultures to snapping turtles. If you've ever operated a livestock farm, you know that predators can be a major issue. This book provides the reader with options on how to control those problems in an efficient and humane manner. It is a great book, not only for experienced farmers, but young people involved with 4-H and FFA, scouting programs, as well as pet owners. The Encyclopedia of Animal Predators is 279 pages, soft bound, and is well illustrated. The book is available through numerous resources. Our Pearl of Wisdom this week tells us, the best way to double your money is to fold it in half and put it back in your pocket. We'd like to close out the show this week by thanking our underwriters and our viewers. You know, we're now in our 15th year of producing this program. That's a lot of episodes, something in the neighborhood of 700 or so. The bottom line is we're always on the lookout for interesting farms and interesting farmers, and Virginia has a lot of them. Feel free to contact us through our website if you have a topic that you'd like to suggest. We'd be happy to take a look at it. Remember, you can catch our show on demand anytime you like, whether it's from your dairy barn or your Christmas tree farm. It's on demand 24-7 at virginiafarming.com. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming.
Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Get in touch with us to hatch a new plan. 